can do that. Okay. Uh, where have we got John? There he is. Uh, good morning, John. Uh, some of you may know this is six o'clock in the morning for John, and it's tomorrow, not today. So, uh, so there's all this confusion. <laughs> But uh, welcome to our uh, to Toronto. Actually, uh, John is a, a pharm pharmacologist and clinic trialist. So he has actually done a lot of work with McMaster University uh, personnel over in Hamilton. So he he's not a, really a stranger to Toronto. In fact, uh, about ten years ago, maybe a little bit longer, he actually did visit our place. Uh, at the time that the yellow lady slippers were all blooming in the garden, and he has some terrific pictures of them up on his uh, on his Flickr site, where he has over 20,000 uh, photographs. So that's worth a look. Um, he his hobby, of course, is growing species orchids from all over the world and to, uh, traveling to find those species orchids uh, in the jungle. Uh, and there are some of us on this in on this screen that like to do that. And this favorite place is Borneo. Uh, I have I've had this sort of you know you, you know that bucket list that we all have. Well, mine is um, has Borneo very prominent on there. And so when he was speaking uh, at a um, Orchid Digest Speakers Day, I heard him speak and he gave this terrific talk on Borneo and I thought I just have to share it with people in Toronto. So please welcome John and we're going to Borneo and be really, really hot. <laughs> Go ahead, okay, John. I'm just, trying to get, I'm just trying to get my screen to share just a sec. I think we have your screen, just need your, your PowerPoint. Okay, no, okay, let me find this here. Have you got that? No, now we don't. Nah. It's fun and games. Okay, try again. Share. Entire screen. Where is it? Ah. Yeah. What can you see now? Now we can see your screen and it has, there, there it is. You got it? There's your program. Okay, cool. Let me just get it in here. Okay. Is that working now? Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, cool. Okay. Um, okay, first off, uh, thank you very much for the invitation to talk to you guys. Um, I think one of the upsides of COVID, if there is any such thing, is the fact that uh, we have learned to communicate in different ways uh, around the world. And uh, our Orchid Species Society in uh, here at home has... Uh, done these sort of Zoom meetings with um, people from the Netherlands and New Zealand, and we're currently uh, setting up a, a Zoom meeting out of the jungles of New Guinea. So um, it's, uh, it's been a great uh, steep learning curve, let's say. Um, secondly, I'd just like to point out that uh, it is 5.30 in the morning, not 6.30. <laughs> so um, well, I think we've got our times a little bit wrong, but anyway, it doesn't matter. I'm glad I got up early. Um, Borneo, why have I, why do I love Borneo? Um, it all started about uh, in about 2005, I think it was, and a friend of mine and I was sitting at a species meeting here, and uh, one of our, uh, the speaker we had was a guy talking about Nepenthes orchids, and uh, mentioned that he went to Mount Kinabalu in Borneo. And Peter, who was sitting next to me, said, uh, gee, I'd love to go to do something like that. And it got me thinking, and I, about 10 minutes later, I turned around to him and said, well, why aren't we doing that? And uh, the one thing led to another, and um, we set off my journey to going to Borneo. And what you're going to see today is the uh, highlights of our 2019 trip. Uh, we try to go every couple of years, and obviously COVID's played havoc with that. And uh, but I'm currently in the process of uh, putting together my next trip, which will probably be next year. Anyway... First off, I hope everybody can hear me okay. Let's just yell if it's if I need to put the volume up or anything. So, um, so where is Borneo? Well, Borneo sits in a. Uh, oops, stop that. Uh, what is going on? I've got a mouse just playing up. Um, Borneo sits in the middle of the South China Sea. We've got uh, 
Cambodia, Vietnam, Philippines, Indonesia, and Malaysia, Singapore surrounding it. It's uh, one of the largest islands in the world, and it just so happens that the uh, equator runs right through the middle of it. And this is a really, really good thing because if you look at uh, the orchid rich countries of the world, they're the ones that have got high altitude and sit on the equator. Uh, places like Ecuador, Peru, um, New Guinea, and obviously Borneo. And uh, so you can see here, this is the topography of Borneo. We've got uh, the equator runs across here. And right down the middle of Borneo is this mountain range called the Crocker Range. And right at the top here, this little white spot is Mount Kinabalu, which is the highest point in Southeast Asia. So anywhere between the Himalayas and the mountains of New Guinea, this is the highest mountain. And it rises to, rises to about 14,000 feet. So it's quite, quite a big mountain. Um, the other thing which you might not know is that this little, little bit here on, um, on Borneo is the area where Indonesia is going to relocate its capital, Jakarta. So they're, going to, they're starting to build a new capital city and unfortunately, with a population of something like 200 million Indonesians and a lot of them migrating to Borneo, it's probably going to be the end of Borneo uh, come the destruction of the rainforest. Um, so if you want to get there, get in there soon because uh, probably 20, 30 years from now, it'll be very different. Okay, so today I'm going to take you a short trip around Saba. Um, Saba being the uh, two, or there's three, four parts of Borneo. There's Kalimantan, which is the Indonesian part. There's uh, Brunei, which is the Sultan of Brunei's little domain, which is this little bit down here. And there's Sarawak and Saba, which are states of Malaysia. And Saba is the area we're going to concentrate on. So we're going to start off in Saba, uh, up here in Kota Kinabalu, which is the capital. Uh, drive down this road here to uh, Sipatang come down another dirt road which is takes us to a place called Long Pasia and Mount Ramau and Mount, and then from Mount Ramau we're going to go up to Tenem then across to this mountain called Mount Trusmadi up to Mount Alab up to Poring back up to Mount Kinabalu because you can't go to Borneo without setting foot on Mount Kinabalu and then back to Saba uh, quick trip down to Mulu National Park, which is it's, um, just about here. And then I'll take you to the Asian Pacific Orchid Congress if we've got time. Okay. As we arrive in Borneo, uh, just, this is the view that you get from the airport. That's Mount Kinabalu in the background there. And uh, it's, it's a very dominating isle, uh, mountain. It's not like your typical mountain. As you can see, it's quite craggy at the top but uh, we'll come back to that later. But it's a nice introduction. And I'm just gonna give you some ideas of the cost of these trips. Um, this is the first hotel we stayed at in, Mount, in uh, Kota Kinabalu, uh, quite a modern hotel. And if you wanna get some idea of the costs, uh, it's $36 for two guests and the Wi-Fi is free, uh, which is nice. And uh, so it's relatively inexpensive. I won't say cheap because um, there was a thing about 20 years ago when the Singaporeans started to become very uh, wealthy. Uh, their president said to them, when you go to Australia, don't be like little birds going cheap, 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 cheap. It's an insult to the locals. So just remember that when you're traveling. Um, the drive to Long Pasia, we hired a car and uh, we arranged to meet up with my friend, Late, who's uh, one of the um, uh, locals down in um, Long Pasia. Uh, Late is, uh, speaks very good English, which is great, and uh, he's become a very good friend of ours over the years. And we arranged to stay at Homestay, which is famous at Long Pasia. You go and actually stay with the villagers in their houses, and uh, they look after you and uh, show you around. Okay, so Long Pasia. Let's go. So Kano Kinabalu picked up the car, said to the lady at the register, I said, now, is there anything we should know about on, on the way down, any dangers or any road conditions we're unaware of? And she said, no, everything's fine. Well, as we headed off, we discovered that uh, the Malaysian government is building a super highway 
from Kota Kinabalu all the way to Kuching in the bottom of Sarawak, which is something like about five or 600 miles. And the whole way was like this, the construction site. So what we thought was going to be a seven or eight, six or seven hour drive ended up being a couple of hours longer. But anyway, this is my friend Lake. We met up with him in Sipatang. Uh, we took our cars to the uh, local church and the minister there looked after them while we were down in the jungle. And we started off on our journey down. This is the road down to uh, Long Pasia. These mountain range over there in the distance, that's the border with Indonesia. And first off, we hit, uh, to, as we turned off the highway, we'd driven a few kilometres and late said, stop, stop, stop. And I started pointing into the forest and there was all these little white spots everywhere. And uh, how, he, how he spotted these things from the road, I don't know, but uh, obviously he's got, his eyesight was better than ours. And you can see the orchid growing on the tree here. We had no idea what it was until we got a bit closer. And we found out it was the um, Dendrobium cuminatum, which is the pigeon orchid, which is very common. It's uh, all over Southeast Asia. So we said, so, yeah, so what's the big deal? Why stop and have a look at this? And for those who've never seen the pigeon orchid, that's what it looks like. And you can see why it's called that. He said, no, 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 it's the tree next to that that you want to look at. And sure enough, they're high up in the forest. There's, there's this, uh, I hope you can see it up there. Uh, there's this wonderful Phalaenopsis amabilis in full bloom. Again, how he spotted that from the road, I have no idea. But this, this orchid is the, the mother of all your plants that you find in your supermarkets or in, in your nurseries or florists. And uh, it's almost extinct in the wild here in Borneo. Uh, so it's been so over collected, it's not funny. But anyway, that was uh, Phalaenopsis amabilis. And this one here actually even grows in northern Queensland. So it's a, we call it an Australian native as well. So. Okay. As we're driving down to Long Pasia along these roads, um, once we get to the Malagan River, we know we're about halfway to Long Pasia. Uh, it's about 112 kilometres of unmade roads, and most of it logging tracks. Uh, there's big signs everywhere, beware logging trucks. And... Uh, so this is the Malagan River. If this causeway is flooded, then uh, you're in deep trouble because you have to drive for another three hours to drive around this area. Okay. Skip now I'm just going to show you a quick video. This is a just more to show you the colour of the water. Uh, the, the wood is not dirty. It's actually the tannin coming out of the decomposing leaves and vegetation upstream and. Uh, and that gives you a typical jungle view of around a river. Okay, so this is the, uh, the logging tracks that we go on and basically you could stop anywhere there and go into the forest and probably find orchids. Uh, you just hope you don't find a truck coming the other way. Uh, so finally we made it to Long Pasia. This is an aerial view of the, the city it's, or the township itself. There's about four or five hundred inhabitants here. And as you can see, there's all these homestays and late places um, up here, Mate's Mataga Highland Gallery. And that's where we stayed. Uh, the village itself looks like this. Uh, you've got a, a lovely soccer oval there for the kids to play on. You've got the Catholic Church, you've got the Anglican Church, and you've got the Presbyterian Church. So the missionaries uh, from way back had done their job on uh, Borneo. Uh, Borneo is predominantly a Christian island. Uh, when we first started going there, it was around about 80-90% um, were Christian. And the change over the last 10-15 years has been significant in that, uh, like Indonesia, which is putting a lot of um, Muslim Javanese into Bali, uh, the Malaysian government is uh, encouraging a lot of Muslim migration to Borneo. And so the population is probably now about 70% Christian. Okay, let's head into the jungle. First off, um, this is late sister who has the, uh, I guess, uh, ironic name of Mary Jane, not uh, that she smokes, but um, we have a, uh, a dinner. This is uh, how they cook. This is typical Malaysian 
and this is how their houses are all built by hand. All these boards are cut from the timber that they find in the forest. Okay, let's head off into the jungle. So as I said, um, this is Late's home here. They've got an airstrip here, which was used during the Second World War. And uh, that airstrip is not in use, so you can't fly there, but uh, there, there are plans by the Malaysian government to actually seal the road from the turn off uh, to Sipatang all the way down to Long Pasir to encourage tourism. And they're talking now about reopening the airport so people will be able to fly from uh, Kuala Lumpur, which is the capital on the mainland of Malaysia, to, Sip to Long Pasir again for uh, ecotourism. Uh, again, uh, once that happens and you start getting hordes of tourists in there, then it's going to make things a lot, a lot more difficult. Uh, <clears throat> so the first thing is we had to trek into the beginning of the jungle and all these tracks you see here are all logging tracks. This is all logging that's been going on. So what happened about um, 20, 30 years ago, the people in Long Pasir were, uh, saw all their young people were leaving to go to the main, uh, to the major capital cities or the major cities. So they encouraged the logging people to come in to create jobs for their young to stay there. Unfortunately, once they saw how devastating the logging was, they're now trying to get rid of the loggers and they've asked um, people like Mary Gerritsen from the US and myself to uh, write letters and write articles for journals to uh, show that what the destruction is doing to try and encourage logging companies to stop doing what they're doing. But I think once they invited them in, it's going to be almost impossible to get them out. Anyway, we had to walk up this little dirt track here, from around here and enter up in here, which is the beginning of the rainforest. This is our little motley crew, myself in the middle here, and uh, uh, Andrew Fernandez, a colleague of mine who uh, works on construction, so he's super fit, and Gary Yonggi from Brisbane, who's a wonderful orchid colleague, and uh, knowledge of orchids is second to none. Our five um, porters and guides, um, you always have to hire porters. You don't want to be carrying backpacks like this through the jungle. So. Uh, they look after us really, really well, and they've got these big, long knives called parangs, which are very useful for cutting your way through the jungle. First orchid we saw once we got into the jungle was this thing, a Laparis latifolia, uh, quite common orchid from China through to New Guinea, but uh, it's always wonderful to find your first orchid for the day, and uh, that's what it looked like. Not very common in cultivation. Another one was uh, Dendrochylum magaense. Uh, maga is the area that we're in, so magaense meaning coming from maga and uh, the maga river. And I make reference here to Jeff Wood. He was a great friend of mine who was um, working at Kew Gardens. Uh, one of the things you find after when you first start doing trekking and photographing in the jungle is that plants in the jungle don't have labels. So when you've spent three or four weeks in the jungle photographing, then you spend about a year trying to work out what you actually photographed. And Jeffrey Wood was uh, amazing help to me and I'd sent him photographs and uh, he identified things like this for me. And uh, unfortunately, he, like another uh, number of people recently, uh, passed away about two years ago. Uh, he went to London to attend his, his sister's funeral and a week later he died himself in London. So quite tragic. And uh, another person like Peter O'Byrne from Borneo, he passed away within about six months of Jeff. And uh, the two people who were my go-tos for identifying plants, um, unfortunately, are no longer here. Uh, this one here is a wonderful beacon in the jungle. It's uh, Acidiera longifolia. It comes from Thailand, Peninsula, Peninsula Malaysia, Borneo and Sumatra. And uh, this white flower stem which sticks up is like a beacon in the dark forest. It's uh, almost impossible not to see and uh, is always a, a favourite of mine. This, this is now actually in cultivation here in Australia, which is nice. Not all orchids. We do see other things like this Aracema species. Um, I should probably take more photos of other blooms and flower in the jungle, but I'm, sometimes I'm preoccupied with finding orchids. So. Um, so just to give you an idea, this is, we finally made it to base camp after about a, probably about a three hour walk and <clears throat> sleeping on the forest floor in our tents. And uh, this gives you an, an overview of our camp. Uh, 
So they always, they put these uh, tarpaulins up to provide some protection from the rain because in the jungle it rains virtually every afternoon. Uh, by evening everything's reasonably dry. But uh, and uh, Darius here is um, collecting herbs which uh, he uses for medicine, with medicinal herbs when he gets home. And uh, we've got a forest fire going. Uh, the one thing which I have to, be, which I have to sort of oops, uh, bring to your attention is the number of leeches in the forest. Now, we don't want to deter anybody from going. The leeches are a natural part of, the, of nature. And uh, the, the locals consider their blood being donated to nature. So um, and I just happened to get a, a really good shot of this one looking right down its mouth. So. Uh, this is what they call a leopard, um, a leopard, sorry, a tiger orchid. It's, uh, sorry, tiger or a tiger's um, leech. As you can see, the big stripe down its side. Now, these are the nasty ones. Uh, there's ground leeches, which are black, and uh, they, they're they not too bad because they actually anaesthetize you when they bite you, and uh, you don't actually feel them getting onto you. These ones live in trees, as you can see here, and uh, drop down onto your shirt while you're walking, and... Uh, they don't anesthetize you and you certainly know when you get bitten by one. Um, when we're trekking through the jungle about every I don't know, 20, 30 minutes, we do a, a, what we call a leech check. We stop and we check each other's backs and arms and legs to see if there's nothing nasty crawling on them. So, so let's get out of here. Come on. Uh, oops. Uh, there we go. One thing you do find uh, but, uh, when you are in the jungle is how these plants grow. And we have very quickly realised that if you want to see a lot of orchids, then you need to go up to the ridges, not down in the valleys. And up in the ridges, you get howling gales blowing across the ridges and giving these orchids the, um, a lot of air movement. And one of the things I find in cultivation is people don't have enough air movement in their collections. Uh, in the jungle, it's, it really is, it does blow a lot and make sure that a lot of the plants, or all the plants are dry by nightfall if there's a uh, tropical rain, rain uh, storm comes down in the afternoon. Okay, so off to the mossy ridge. Um, you can see the locals are pre preparing our breakfast for us and after about two or three weeks in the jungle, if you ever saw another uh, deep fried banana, you'd scream, but um, that was a staple diet. Uh, canned tuna, canned uh, uh, rice and stuff like that. So, uh, and uh, after we had breakfast, um, Andrew did a bit of spotting and found our first orchid, which is on a tree in the campsite. And this is a bulb of film. As you can see, the roots are exposed on the trunk of the tree. It's got a little bit of moss to provide some nutrients, but uh, quite moist as we had a very heavy rain overnight. And uh, this orchid looks like this. Uh, Trisatella, it's uh, not in cultivation to my knowledge. It took a long time to work out what it was. Another Lim Liparis, Rhombia. Uh, Rhombia uh, because of its shape. Again, common around Southeast Asia. And another unusual orchid is this one on the right, which is a saprophytic orchid called a Phylorchis pallida. Uh, it's found growing in the leaf litter. It has no uh, chlorophyll, as you can see, it's completely white. And uh, the actual orchid is surviving on uh, its symbiotic relationship with the fungus in the forest floor. If you try to grow this in cultivation, you will have no luck whatsoever. Cylogeny are uh, very common around uh, Borneo. Um, the trip, this trip we did, we did was in July, and there weren't a lot in, in bloom, but uh, the best time to go if you want to see Cylogeny is probably in, uh, October, November. Uh, whenever we go October, November, there's just flowers everywhere. Um, this is one of the smaller ones, and as you can see, rather insignificant flower, almost totally white except for the anther cap. And, then you see things like this, which really, really stun you in the forest. You get uh, a lovely umbel for flowers like this, uh, Bobophyllum brevi brachiatum, and the actual flower spike is like this, and you, it's just, uh, just magnificent. 
coming back to some other bulbophyllum. This is called catenarium um, because of the way that the orchid grows in chains. The bulb, pseudobulbs have these long chains which run across the face of the, the mount that they're on. And they have some lovely little orange, yellow and red flowers. Appendicular pendula. Appendicular are everywhere. Uh, there's a lot of different species, very difficult to identify. And as you can see on this one, that's the actual flower. It doesn't open very much and uh, sort of sequentially flowering. And there's lots as these ones drop off, these ones start opening. Lots of Nepenthes, uh, the pitcher plants, and these are quite big, they're probably about uh, a foot in length. And uh, when you see a tree covered in these, it's really quite spectacular. And up on the mossy ridge where we were heading, uh, you'll see we saw plenty of uh, pitcher plants. Cylogeny cupria, cupria obviously meaning coming from the Latin for copper. And when you see the flower, you can see why it's called that. Uh, one of those which should be in more collections in, in you know, especially here in Australia, not often, see, not often seen in collections here. Rhododendrons, plenty up there. Um, Andrew, my colleague who was with us, he's a rhododendron freak as well, so he's identifies these for me, which is really nice. And as you're walking through the mossy ridge, you can see why we call it the mossy ridge. All the branches are covered in moss. And there's orchids everywhere. This is one little branch with a uh, number of species. There's one little orchid growing there, another one there, another one here, 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 here. So you can see just on that, probably about what, just over a foot long, there's probably about six or seven plants growing on there. What I'm going to show you is some of the lesser known orchids. Um, there's lots of things we saw which are quite common. But um, I'm going to sort of focus on more on things which you've probably never seen in cultivation. This one being one of them, Octorina angracoides. Uh, I've never even heard of the genus Octorina, uh, but here you go. It's um, one of those monopodial orchids, uh, Vandacious, uh, growing away from the trunk of the trees here. And as you can see, it's growing up and there's a lovely flower spike, a dead flower spike up here. And that's what the flower looks like. Very insignificant little gr green flower with a very prominent white anther cap on it. Another very unusual and rare orchid <coughs> is Strongaleria, another genus I'd never heard of until I discovered this. And uh, comes from New Guinea, Philippines, Sulawesi and uh, New Guinea. And that's the flower here. Uh, it's quite a large plant and I don't think uh, it would uh, it's been very common in cultivation, even in Borneo. So. You have to remember when you're in the forest that um, not everything is uh, there for your pleasure. And a lot of these flowers are also very tasty for the local rodents. And, uh, and this flower, Dendrobium speculum, which unfortunately, as you can see, has had, uh, it's been chopped off. Something's got nibbled at it. Uh, the petals and sepals have been nibbled. Uh, but you still take a photo of it because it may be the only one you actually see. But we were fortunate enough that about uh, 15, 20 metres down the path, um, we found one which was in pristine condition. So uh, this one would also be another one, a nice one to have in cultivation. But uh, the distance between bulbs is quite long, so it would be difficult to keep uh, in a pot. That's for sure you'd need to mount it. And this one here is Dendrobium longipes, and it's uh, sorry, Dendrochylum. Uh, this is probably my favourite Dendrochylum. It's not in cultivation as far as I can see, but uh, it was described by Geoffrey Woods from Kew, and uh, the flower is absolutely magnificent. Um, it only comes. He wrote he, in his book on Dendrochylums. He said that it uh, was endemic to Borneo from Kalimantan and Sarawak. Uh, Mulu and Barrio. Barrio I went to on a previous trip and uh, Mulu which is on the other side of the range that we're on now and uh, this this is the actual flower. I think it's absolutely magnificent. It really opens up widely for a dendrochylum and uh, this is probably the first time this plant's actually been uh, identified in, um, in Saba. So a new and my friend Darius, as we discovered, was an absolute wonder in terms of spotting. Once they realised what we were looking for, all our guides um, 
we've had another set of eyes looking for orchids for us and uh, you'd be hearing shouts from the, around the forest here, here, here. And uh, it was great. So that was the uh, the highlights of the um, the, the, the uh, ridge, the, the mossy ridge. And uh, the next day we decided to do a trip to the Hidden Lake. Now the Hidden Lake is, this is the lake. It um, was discovered about 30 years ago on Mount Ramau, high up towards the summit. And uh, it's called Hidden because uh, the, because of the rainforest, it was almost impossible to, to see from the air and therefore not really discovered till recently. And when we were there about in 2011, we found this orchid. Um, it's called Kalanistelli. It's got a species Novo on it. Uh, nobody has been able to identify it. I've sent it to um, as many botanic gardens around the world that I can think of who might be able to help. And there's a guy called Jacques de Mulin who works at the Leiden Botanic Gardens and he's become a good friend of ours. And uh, he's currently doing a revision of all the bulb of film of uh, New Guinea but he's a prolific author. And when I sent him pho this, these photos of this plant, his first question to me back on his email was, did you get a piece of the plant? And uh, after a bit of discussion, he said he's never seen it before. It's quite distinctive with this red anther cap. And uh, we decided that we would go back and try and get a piece of this orchid so they could call it uh, uh, Johnny Eye or something like that. But um, when we got back to the lake, unfortunately, we found that the lake was flooded and uh, it had been a quite a wet season and the orchid on the tree which we knew uh, where it grew uh, was in the middle of the lake and we didn't have a boat so uh, we had no way of getting to it so that's our, my encouragement to go back for the next trip next year. So on the way to the Hidden Lake uh, we came across a number of different bulbar films and I hope people watching are interested in bulbar films because there's some really really nice ones. Uh, bulbar films for Vessence which looks like this and uh, a bit further on we came across um, Bulbophyllum mutabili uh, and you can see the, the segments are almost translucent. Um, we almost see the leaf through the petals. Came across a Calanthium and this one here I thought was Calanthe pulchra. Uh, it's very common in Malaysia and when I posted some photos on my Flickr page a friend of mine Ongpo Tech from Malaysia works in the forestry there came back and said no 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 it's Musa Amani which I've never heard of so uh, one of the good things about posting your photos on uh, social media is that uh, all the world's experts get to look at them and, and uh, correct you if you get it wrong. And that's the flower. Um, there should be a lot more calanthes in cultivation. They really are spectacular when you see them in bloom. Another little catenarium which gives you a better idea of, as you can see, the pseudo bulbs growing one on top of the, each other each, each year as they mature. And there's a, a better photo. This one is. Um, one of my favourite bulbar films. I photographed this about uh, in the 2011 and I sent it to Jacques Vermeulen and who was writing his book on the bulbar films of Borneo at that stage and he used my photos in his book which was very nice of him and uh, this is you know, it's just, just a really delightful bulbar film but uh, not in cultivation as far as I know. And this one here is one of my favourites, uh, Jolande. It's endemic to Sabah and described by Jarp in 1991. And I'll give you one head on and uh, you can see how this is pollinated through mimicry. That looks like a, some sort of an insect. And obviously whatever pollinates that um, is, thinks it's having a great time, but it's actually helping the orchid more than it's helping itself But um, when it tries to pollinate. But it's a wonderful, wonderful flower and so lucky to see it. And this one is Bulbophyllum lobii, which is quite common. Uh, most people have seen it at some stage in cultivation, but this actually shows you it growing in, in nature. And what I've actually photographed it for is not so much the flower because everyone's seen it, it's just to show you how they grow. And you can see when you talk about fertilizing orchids, how the leaf litter uh, collects around the roots. And there's another one of the plant and uh, this has got dead leaves and whatever dropping out of the heavens um, 
sitting in amongst the, the leaves, uh, some of the pseudo bulbs, and as they de as the material decomposes, it provides the nutrients for the orchid, so it's self-fertilizing, so to speak. Uh, in I must say, my orchid collection, I'm very poor at remembering to fertilize, and, uh, and after growing orchids for over 40 years, I find that you know they don't really need a lot of fertilizing anyway, because of, when you see them in the jungle, you know they're lucky to get any fertilizer whatsoever. Um, other than decomposing leaf material, maybe occasional bird dropping, and most of the nutrients comes out of the uh, the tropical rainforest. Um, some rain that uh, lightning strikes causes nitrogen to dissolve in the water and providing nutrients for them. And you can see nature's been doing its bit, and there's a lovely seed pod on this orchid. So its uh, future is guaranteed. The local, the, our guides are really terrific at uh, helping us uh, trying to photograph orchids. This, uh, we're looking at that lobby eye and I wanted to get some photos of it. And so what they do is they just go and cut some saplings like this. One gets on one end, one gets on the other, and late stands on the on the bridge that they're formed, and they just lift you up into the into the forest. We don't have ladders with us, so the only way to get up higher is using this technique. And uh, late's using my camera, trying to. This is, this is a posed shot for you guys. And this is what we were trying to photograph. We saw a splash of yellow just below the lobby eye, and it didn't look like lobby eye. And uh, by getting up a bit closer, we found that it was this orchid, which again is one that's not very common. It's a membrana folium, it's another yellow flower, but um, when you look at the flower, it was worth the effort to get a photo of it. Um, Again, why this is not in cultivation, more common, I don't know. It's just a, it's just a spectacular plant. Uh, like cooking lunch for us. Again, you get your bit ubiquitous. Lunch in the forest, uh, yeah. going towards the hidden Okay, so I'll skip that. Um, now this this is the orchid flower here. This is walking around the hidden lake, trying to console ourselves that we're not going to be able to get a piece of that plant that we were looking for. And we found this tiny little bulb of film. Um, I didn't think the flower was open because you can see it's not, not magically. And that's a close up of it. It looked like the flower was closed. And then I flipped it over to find that it, the flower was fully open. Um, and you have this little keyhole in here, which obviously lets the pollinator in. And it's, on getting back, I found it was. Um, Bulbophyllum saccadanium, and it has some remarkable similarities with the genus Zootrophion from South America, and that's a photo of Zootrophion. And again, you see this little keyhole, and for the pollinator to get into. So uh, I'm just wondering whether this is an example of convergent uh, evolution, where uh, plants from different sides of the world have found the same. Uh, evolutionary path to uh, success in pollination. So it's pretty, pretty remarkable. Uh, another little bulb of film on this track was um, this little low hockey eye, uh, which is endemic to Saba, the only place you'll find it in the world. And again, one that should be in more collections. I think Marnie Turkel over in California in San Francisco has this in flasks if you want to get a piece. Now this bulb of film is uh, another one which you'd have to mount if you had it in cultivation. You can see how the pseudo bulbs just grow along this long rhizome. And the flower itself is almost as big as the plant itself. So uh, last one we found for the day and uh, there's the flower itself. Okay, so that was our days in the jungle. I'm going to trek back to Long Pasia to see what we saw on the way back to camp. To, the, to our homestay and some philodota, another lovely little folidota, uh, some dendrobium maroparens. Now, this is particularly interesting because maroparae is a plateau on Mount Kinabalu where this was first identified. And it was supposed to be endemic to, to Mount Kinabalu. And to actually see this growing on Mount Rumau, uh, maybe this is the first uh, time that it's been seen in a place off, off Mount Kinabalu. And that's the flower. Very big dendrobium, so again, one that's probably not going to be 
many in many uh, collections. Now this is a cylogeny called Naja, which probably none of you have ever seen. I'd never seen it before. Q says it grows in Kalimantan and Sarawak, but here we were on Mount Romao in Sabah. And again, this is probably the first proof that this mount, this orchid grows in Sabah. Um, the word Naja, and that's the flower, Naja means is the Malay word for uh, snake and particularly the cobra snake. And uh, we have no idea why it was called that by whoever discovered it, but uh, it's supposed that probably there was a, a cobra near the plant when he found it, and uh, hence he named it Naja. But, um, again, one that's not in cultivation to my knowledge. Some of the species of orchids that um, we haven't been able to identify, this is a Crepidium, it's a terrestrial, and uh, I, I've these photos that I took have been sent to um, orchid people around the world. I, I look, I do a search of the literature, find uh, find the names of people who are actually publishing papers on things like Crepidium. So I send these to to them because they're more likely to know what the plants are, and uh, I get the emails back saying never seen it before. So again, it's probably species Novo, never been described. Um, this one is a little dendro dendrobium, which I think should be in collections as well, because it's a, not a very big flower, but um, it's endemic to Norway, uh, to, Nor uh, to Nasaba and Sarawak, and that's the flower, which is um, really, really nice. It's um, this pink on it, and it's quite, and the yellow is uh, just a really delightful flower. Uh, Thrixpum magus. Uh, unfortunately, all, a lot of the literature, uh, some of the literature that I consult doesn't have photos of every plant that uh, I see. Uh, this one is from the book called The Orchids of Borneo and uh, written by uh, Jarpa Mulian and uh, Tony Lamb, who you'll meet later. Uh, Thrixpermum is an uncommon sp uh, species or genus. And uh, by going by the description in the book, uh, I pinpointed this to be Thrixpermum majus because everything about the description marries up with the flower. Uh, and that's the flower, which is pretty insignificant, but uh, you can see the roots here attaching to the bottom of the, uh, the branch and it just hangs down uh, like that. And there's the, the long root, which grows right along the edge of that. It's what they probably call a twig epiphyte, so when that branch dies off, that's the end of that orchid. But, um, another species which we haven't been able to identify, Nephalophyllum species. Uh, it's one of the jewel orchids of the forest, and uh, you can see you know, the beautiful mottling on the leaf. I sent it to a lady who works on Mount Kinabalu who just wrote an article on these, and uh, again, she came back and said she had no idea what it was. So. Um, we've got GPS on our photos, so hopefully we, when we next go back to the forest, we can I find these again and uh, maybe take it back for identification. So we're back at homestay now. This is uh, Late's house. Um, gives you an idea of the rustic nature of how they live, and I was very taken by the fact that he had a, an Australian flag up there, but I suspect that uh, the flag changes by the group he's taking around. But, um, He's a wonderful artist as well, and these are some of the paintings he's, or some of his drawings that he does on the walls. Karangas Forest. Karangas, what does Karangas mean? Karangas is a Malay term for an area of low nutrient. And if you find a Karangas Forest, explore it very carefully because, because of the low nutrients in the soil, a lot of the plants there uh, have evolved quite differently to the surrounding area and you find a lot of endemism there and the plants which you'll find nowhere else. So when we went, uh, first went to uh, Borneo, I met up with Tony Lamb, who's probably is an expat Brit who lives in Kota Kinabalu and he's written a number of books on the orchids of Borneo uh, with that, with the Sharper Mulan and uh, with Geoffrey Wood. And he told us when you go to Long Pasia, and he was the one that told us to go there, he said, you must explore the Karangas forest near it. So we went there and uh, and I'm saying what's left of it because so disappointingly when we have went back this tr last trip, we found that the Karangas forest, about two thirds of it had been destroyed. The owner of the air of the land that which the Karangas forest was on 
uh, decided that he was going to convert the forest into a rubber tree plantation. So he, they bulldozed two thirds of the area and a number of very, very rare orchids disappeared. In particular, this one here, which is um, Bulbophyllum ericksonia. You probably know it better as Bulbophyllum virescence. Uh, it's a not uncommon orchid from Borneo, Java, Peninsula, Malaysia, uh, Sulawesi, right through to New Guinea. And but fortunately for us, this actual plant itself, the flowers are uniquely coloured. And uh, this is a photograph I took in 2011 when we first went there. This orchid is normally uh, an epiphyte, but this was growing on the forest floor. It obviously fallen out of the tree. And you can see all the leaf litter around it, and it was in full bloom. You can see from, from the fly on it that it's, um, it's got a pungent odour. And the colour of this orchid, which is this orange-red colour, is quite unique to this particular plant. Most of the flowers that you see of this species are a, green, a greenish colour. This plant was uh, probably, we calculated about 400 square metres in area, probably about 20 metres by 20 metres probably 60 feet by 60 feet in size. It was a massive plant. And um, when we got back there this time, we found that the uh, plant's still there, but um, it's, it was probably only about two square metres in size now. All that 400 square metres had all been bulldozed, and this is the last bit of it left. So we've said to late uh, to really, really look after this plant. He's doing a tremendous job now by taking plants from uh, other areas of Borneo, which are around the logging area, and reintroducing them to what's left of the Karangas forest. Um, we, we hope to raise some money to buy the rest of this forest from the owner, but the owner won't sell it to us. And uh, so we're, we're, we haven't given up on him yet, so we push, so we're on a fundraising to get enough money to make him an offer he can't refuse. But it's well worth saving if we can. And uh, that used to be the sign to the forest to, to, to tell us that uh, the Karangas forest, but uh, ain't there anymore. Okay, so these are some of the plants in the forest that we saw, uh, Dendrobium pachyphyllum, little Dendrobium, uh, which is seen nowhere else. Uh, then a, a Denonchus parviflora, again, a genus I'd never heard of. And uh, you can see how it's growing very healthily there. And that's the flower. And they even do get scale in the forest. There you go. Okay, next trip was from Long Pass here up the logging track, which is this windy track, which takes about three, two, three hours to get to the main road and then uh, this quick trip up to Tenham. And the reason we go to Tenham is this Saba Agriculture Park. And this was uh, a park which was um, built by Tony Lamb uh, about 40 years ago when he first went to Borneo and was working for the uh, Saba Agricultural Department. And uh, he, it's a wonderful park where uh, you find trees from all over Malaysia have been are growing in cultivation. And it's got a wonderful, fantastic orchid garden, which Tony uh, first started. So it's about 200 hectares, and there's about 400 species of the 1,500 species in Borneo in this park. I'm only going to show you one because it's a and that's this one here, uh, Stichorchis lobigensis. And the reason I'm showing you this is to show how the Malays have go about uh, displaying their plants in, uh, in collections. Um, here's, a, here's the flower of this plant. And what really intrigued me was next to it was a QR code with this Leparis with the name on it. You get your mobile phone out, you scan the code, and up comes all this information on your mobile phone about the orchid you're looking at. And I thought, what a wonderful way to go around the botanic gardens looking at trying to see and find out information about any particular plant which catches your attention. And uh, I'm trying to encourage our local botanic gardens here to do something similar. This is the hotel we stayed at in, uh, in Tenham and gave me a chance to check out my leech bites. And uh, you can see that uh, even after a few days, they're healing really, really rapidly. The reason for that is that we take doxycycline, which is an antibiotic, uh, which protects us against malaria. And... Uh, and obviously being loaded to the gills with uh, anti antibiotics, uh, the infection is virtually zero. 
Okay, Mount Trismadi. I've always wanted to go into Mount Trismadi. I uh, haven't climbed halfway up Mount Kinabalu. And the reason I've only gone halfway up Mount Kinabalu, and many people have asked me, have you climbed Mount Kinabalu, uh, which is the highest mountain in Southeast Asia? And I said, no, I've never climbed Mount Kinabalu. I have no desire to climb Mount Kinabalu because after about halfway up the mountain, there's no orchids. And, uh, and then when you do climb to the top of Mount Kinabalu, uh, you get a magnificent uh, view of the sunrise, but um, many times it's covered in clouds, so it's an, an effort not worth making as far as I'm concerned. Now, Mount Trismadi is the second highest mountain in Southeast Asia after Mount Kinabalu at 2,600 metres or around about 8,500 feet. And uh, it's a much more challenging climb than uh, Mount Kinabalu. And uh, so we thought we'd give it a go. So here we are in Tenem, drive up to Kenegao, and then we follow the valley uh, to the little place called Kenegao up here. And this is Mount Trismadi Forest Reserve, and this is Mount Trismadi. Now, the thing about Mount Trismadi, unlike Mount Kinabalu, is that it had been, it has been logged. Uh, all the lower areas of the mountain is now secondary rainforest. The logging has stopped, but the rainforest is only now starting to make a comeback. And we first part of your trip is up logging tracks, and you'll see what happens when the region rejuvenation. I'm just throwing this in to show you what happens with the destruction of the rainforest. This is the, uh, the access roads to this area. This is an aerial view of the logging of the rainforest. And you can see how dense and how few trees actually survive. And once they've cleared the land, uh, they start planting up the, um, the palm trees. And these are for palm oil. And as the forest matures, you can see the canopy is so dense that nothing will grow underneath it. Uh, you might get an occasional orchid growing in there, but um, you find nothing except snakes in here, and uh, it's not nice. I remember when I first flew to, to, uh, to Kuala Lumpur, the capital of Malaysia, uh, probably about, I don't know, 40 years ago, as we flew in, Malaya, the capital was, followed, was completely surrounded by tropical jungle. It's now tr it's completely surrounded by palm trees. So they've lost it all in 40 years. Now, this is a little video showing you. This is the camp we stayed at, Dennis's place, which was our base camp. And Mount Trusmati is that little peak sitting there. And, uh, and that was the terrain that we had to, to walk through. So, and coming round to Dennis, this is the guy who cut the track up to the top of Mount Trusmadi. There's Andrew contemplating whether he's going to climb the mountain. And, uh, and you can see the only way form of communication is by satellite um, dishes. Uh, they don't, that's the only Wi-Fi they've got. The signal is very poor, but, uh, but uh, anyway, uh, one of the local f um, uh, markets we visited just before we climbed up the mountain just to get some local flavours. Our huts that uh, Dennis has built for accommodation. He hosts a number of different religious groups here uh, who go climbing the mountain. And, and, and uh, so let's head off to track, track to Camp 2. Uh, They've built a suspension bridge which gets us across the river, so we get uh, we don't have any wet boots, which is nice. And uh, but uh, you have to be very careful as you're going across these pebbles, these stones in the water, because they've had um, centuries of water running over them, and they are like glass, and very very smooth. And you have to be, tread carefully. And you can see this is the old logging track that's uh, been cut up there, and all these trees of secondary rainforest coming back. We trekked, uh, for, it took us seven hours to climb to Camp 2. It's probably the hardest trek I've ever done. And uh, we found very, very few orchids in this area because it, because of the logging, they're just not there anymore. Uh, this is the first one we found, which is Didymoplexiella kinabaloensis. And kinabaloensis means it was first discovered on Mount Kinabalu. Anything with ensis on the end it means from, so from Kinabalu. Um, this is, might be the first sighting of this on Mount Trismadi. 
and this is the orchid flower spike coming up, 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 and there's the flowers. This is a saprophytic orchid, or they call them now mycoheterotrophic, and uh, was growing right in the middle of the path. Again, no, no um, chlorophyll whatsoever, purely saprophytic, and here's the, the flower itself covered in cobwebs. What you find is uh, many orchids in the jungle have got uh, a growing association with spiders. Obviously the spiders realize that uh, these flowers are attracting pollinators which make, might make some lovely tucker for them from food. Another lovely calanthe which we found. This is one of the few orchids we saw going up the mountain. Uh, and that's the flower. As I said, these calanthe should be more common in cultivation. They really are delightful flowers. Uh, no, we haven't. We haven't trekked 7.2 kilometres. That tells you how how far it is to the top. It's how much further you've got to go. So, if you wanted to climb to the summit, so another two kilometres later, we're getting there. Now, this is still part of the logging track, and uh, how they got logs up and down here, I've got no idea. But they managed it, and here's Gary struggling to get up there our porter at the back this, this kid was 14 years of age and he climbs this mountain virtually every day so uh, that's there that'll be his future being a, a guide to uh, people going up the mountain uh, one of the nice jewel orchids we found on this mountain um, once we get to the where the logging had stopped the, the orchids are plenty plenty of things to see and this is one of the stunning jewel orchids uh, which was uh, Supposedly found on Mount Kinabalu and Mount Alab, but uh, now I've also documented that it actually goes on Mount Trusmadi as well. And again, you can see the beautiful leaf patterning on this and the flowers. Uh, well worth growing in, in collections if you can get it. More Nepenthes, and uh, there's a number of Nepenthes which are endemic to this mountain, which I didn't see. Uh, there's a Paphiopedilum sugiyamamum, which I don't think has been in cultivation. This is very rare. Uh, it wasn't in bloom, but you can see it did have a flower spike originally on it. And uh, I photographed the plant to show it's a mottled leaf Paphiopedilum slipper orchid. And uh, I looked at all the uh, search of the internet and searching of all the books that I could not find. I could only find one photo of the flower of this, and that's the flower. Uh, so it's obviously so rare that uh, very few people have actually seen it in bloom or even have it in cultivation. Uh, there's no flower of it in Orchid Whiz. There's, there's no photo of a flower in Orchid Whiz. And there's uh, virtually no flowers on any websites that I could find. Uh, Cryptostylus. Um, we have a, a fondness for Cryptostylus because they're in, also Cryptostylus in Australia. And this one's called Acutata. And... Uh, a terrestrial orchid and they grow typically like this upside down so they're non resupinate flowers and uh, the beautiful red labellum spotted red and I took this photo to give you some idea of the steepness of the terrain it's probably around about a 30 degree incline uh, we use the tree and because uh, that tree is growing vertically and you get an idea from the pitch of the land there how steep it is Andrew was holding on for dear life trying to get up to photograph this plant and uh, it's called Aridostachia robusta, quite common through um, Southeast Asia, coming all the way from Taiwan, Thailand, all the way through to the Caroline Islands and New Caledonia and Vanuatu in the Pacific. And that's the flower spike close up. Magnificent, but they are, do form very large plants. And this gives you some idea of uh, how difficult it was to climb once the brain, once the logging track had stopped. Uh, the logging track climb was very steep and hard, but this was even more tricky because all these uh, roots uh, are quite are wet and they and you have to you have to tread carefully. Um, our porters had been uh, had great foresight in putting this handrail up for us to be able to use to get up these steps. And bear in mind that everything in the rainforest probably decays within about a year, so you, again you have to tread warily that uh, none of these steps have actually rotted out. This is the camp that, uh, at Camp 2. Now, I've taken these. These are the huts which have uh, been built up there. Now, all the material that you see there has been carried up by hand or cut out of the forest. Uh, these big logs up here have all been cut from forest trees, but 
all the corrugated iron which is on on the all the tarpaulins have all been carried up by hand up this mountain which as i said was an incredibly steep climb uh, they've got bunks for tour groups uh, that was my bed down the back there um, and that gives you a view across the valley so you can see this is the Crocker range and uh, looking back down to where we started our climb and this is our accommodation hut the second hut is for the porters to use uh, this is our eating area and that's the kitchen down there and they actually now when we got to the top of the mountain I said how thirsty I was and uh, you wouldn't believe it but they brought out this this is this is rice wine which they'd been brewing for a, about a month all the porters take rice up and they start the fermentation process for the next time they go up there and they have a wonderful time overnight getting drunk on rice wine while we're all sleeping so um, there you go they are uh, very resourceful the reason people climb Trusmadi, not only because it's the second highest mountain in, uh, in Borneo, but also they get a wonderful view of Mount Kinabalu once you get to the top of the mountain. This is not my photograph, but that's Mount Kinabalu. Uh, so you can see it's not a, a classic, typical style mountain that you'd envisage. It's got these really craggy rigs on, ridges on it. And uh, that's the view from the summit. Now, to get to get to the summit, Camp Two is probably about halfway up, or maybe probably more, about two thirds of the way up Mount Trusmadi, and they get you up at about one o'clock in the morning, and you put on your helmet light, and uh, on your head, and you start climbing up in the dark to get to the summit before sunrise, so you can get a photo like this. I decided that um, uh, I would not make the summit climb. I left that to Andrew, who was much younger and fitter than I am, and uh, It'll hit, it almost killed him, so he said there was no way that uh, that Gary and I would have made it. So I'm, I'm glad I chose the lesser of two evils and uh, sat back and decided that um, I'd watch uh, the sunrise from here. And this is just a video of, uh, just showing you what it's like around the camp. They actually provide a little seat for you to sit and watch the sunrise and... the forest the path that you see going up here is the summit path and I can quickly there you go sunrise on the Crocker range okay Give you an idea of what uh, what you eat every day is um, rice noodles, rice, and the ubiquitous three-in-one Nescafe coffee, which is a combination of coffee, uh, condensed milk, powdered milk, and sugar. If you don't like sugar in your coffee or milk in your coffee, you don't have any choice. It's a three-in-one. You get what you take. You take what you get, and that's it. But um, these packs are everywhere. So this is the summit track which Andrew went up in the middle of the night and uh, Gary and I decided to explore it while he was up climbing or climbing back and uh, these are some of the plants we saw. Um, you see how they grow on the trunks of the trees and virtually no moss on there. There's another orchid up there and that's the flower. Uh, this one is Bulbophyllum disjunctum. Uh, this is a very, very rare to see this one in bloom. I first photographed it on Mount Kinabalu and uh, Jacques Vermeulen in the Netherlands identified it. He said uh, it's a very common orchid, but to actually see it in bloom, it blooms only about once every 10 years, uh, so they say. And this one is in flower, as you can see. Uh, unfortunately, I've got a bit of a leaf in the photo, but it gives you an idea. And so this is the actual topography of it that's the the homestay that we were at and we climbed up this ridge here all the way up to camp two which is here and then the summit climb is up here over the top there's a little valley here and then you get to the top of mount trismadi which is gunung trismadi and that's so that's the climb that you, if you ever want to go climbing mount trismadi that's what you're going to have to get up so mount a lab 
next mountain. Um, so we're here at Mount Trismadi. The only way to get to Mount Alab, which is up here, is to backtrack because the mountain range is there. You can't go over it. So it's a three and a half hour drive from from Mount Trismadi to Gunung Alab, Mount Alab. Now, Mount Alab is probably only about 50, 60 kilometres from Kota Kinabalu, which is the capital. And it's it's a great mountain because, oops, is Motley Crew forget that. And it's a great mountain to go exploring on because it's got the telecommunication towers on there for Kota Kinabalu. So all the TV and radio um, signals have bounced off this mountain. And because of that, they need ready access to the telecommunication towers. And as you can see, the road is bitumenized. So you can actually drive to the top of the mountain. You don't have to trek to get to the top. And uh, albeit the mount, the bitumen is not that good. There's lots of potholes. At least you can actually drive up and uh, start you're exploring from the top without having to struggle up. And things we find up there is trichotosia, which is uh, trico is the Greek word for hairy, and you can see why this thing is covered in hairs. And this is one of the most common or the more common of the trichotosias. Uh, Dendrobium alabens, this one was um, first discovered on Mount Alab and uh, named after Alabens, being from Alab. And again, one of these dendrobiums that should be in collections but is not, and I think it's a delightful flower. Uh, one of my favourites, um, Cilogeny radioferens. Uh, doesn't seem to matter what, what month of the year you go there, this thing's in, it's in bloom. Um, I've been there in March, I've been there in July, I've been September, October, November, and this thing's always flowering. And that's the flower spike. Uh, a Penalia species, been unable to identify this one. And that's one of the flower that was open, it's the only one that was open, but uh, nobody knows what it is. And another one which took me a long time to find uh, a name for. And that's this one here. And uh, there's no, this is probably the, one of the first photographs of this orchid. None of the books that I've consulted had a photo of this, but only, I've only identified it with the help of Sharp in the Netherlands and, my, and the book's description. So there it is. Uh, Dendrobium lamii, named after our mate Tony Lamb, who you'll meet shortly. And Tony's a co-author of many of the books of Borneo, the orchids of Borneo. Probably if you've got any books, they're probably written by Tony. And this is a name, a Dendrobium named after him. There's two colour forms of it. There's this browny colour and then there's a, a more greeny colour form. An Oberonia, there's lots of these. And you can see they have the typical uh, downward growing um, growth habit. A lot of people try to grow these in pots standing upright and they wonder why they get crown rot. Uh, they grow down like this so any water on it just runs off the plant and doesn't get caught in the crown. So another good thing about going into the jungle you actually get to see how plants actually grow in nature and how they should be. You know, this should definitely be mounted if you grow oberonias. And uh, this was identified by Daniel Geiger. I posted a photo on my uh, Flickr account and Daniel Geiger, who's a world authority on Oberonia from the US, and he came back and said that uh, this is definitely dubia, uh, which the books all say is only endemic to Java. And he said, no, it's more common than that. And he's going through doing a re full redescription of all the Oberonias and said that because their seed is so small and light, they travel a lot further than people have thought. And that's the flower on it. And you can see it's quite, quite a small little plant. Oops. And here's a, a little video of the of Mount Alab. There's an orchid there just showing you. It's not a dense forest, but... Um, there's a lot of light coming through from the canopy, but there's orchids growing on all these saplings covered in moss. And as you can see, there's just orchids everywhere. The difficulty is finding ones that are in bloom. And and uh, there's one there which we found. And 
and that's the actual photo of the plant itself and uh, has this very long flower spike and there's the flowers out here. Uh, it's called Umbriculatum, which is quite common through Southeast Asia. There's a very uh, pretty bland, creamy white flower. Uh, some of the uh, things that you have to be a little bit careful of when you're trekking the forest. This is a native beehive. This is a fallen tree in which they've done and burrowed a hole in here. So the, inside this hollow tree is the hive. And uh, once our natives spotted this, they were very, once the locals spotted it, they very, very warily walked around this tree. So uh, they have a very nasty sting. Uh, a couple more rhododendrons for you. And as we're driving down the mountain, it was very dark. Now it's getting dark. It's around, around about five or six o'clock in the evening. And Gary was sitting in the back seat. Andrew was driving. I was in the passenger seat. And as we turned a corner where we had to slow down a bit to get around a hairpin bend, uh, Gary in the back seat yelled, stop, stop, stop. And he spotted a flash of orange in the forest floor. And this is what he'd seen. It was uh, Calanthe kinabaloensis, which is endemic to northern Sabah. And this was the one and only plant which was in bloom, and uh, it's quite a spectacular. And as I said, you know, should be more calanthes in cultivation. That's a magnificent specimen of, of an orchid. Uh, our accommodation, to just again to give you some idea of what, what the hotels are like inside, big double bed, very spotlessly clean toilets and baths and showers facilities and uh, modern and uh, the cost of that was something of the order of around about $20, $30 a night. This is the view from my room looking out the back of that hotel or motel and these ladies are planting rice and uh, doing it by hand which they've probably been doing for thousands of years and when you look at how much they've planted, it just blew me away. They're obviously, the, just not the two of them, they must have others to help because it's a huge area that they've planted up and uh, not an easy job to do and uh, but uh, keeps them out of mischief, I suppose. Pouring hot springs and nature reserve. Uh, so here we are, Tenem, driving up here to hot springs, Pourham. Again, it's a lovely orchid nursery which has been developed at the hot springs. These are natural hot water coming out of the mountain and uh, very popular with the locals in terms of um, a resort. But the only reason we go there is they've got a very good orchid garden. And then we'll finish up back at uh, Mount Kinabalu. One of the reasons we go to that area is that um, rafflesias are very common. And uh, this is Rafflesia keithii, which is the largest flower in the world. Uh, from one side to the other is over a metre, so looking at about uh, 33 inches across, so it's a very, very big flower. Uh, so, no, no, sorry, it's, three, it's a metre across, what am I talking about? So it's uh, three feet across. Uh, it's usually covered in flies because it absolutely stinks, and uh, it's, it grows uh, in conjunction with uh, this uh, bit of branch that you can see, which is the a vine. It's, it, uh, it's parasitic on the vine itself. And uh, as you're driving down the forest roads uh, to get to pouring, you'll see little signs up, uh, Rafflesia, Rafflesia, and there's a guy standing there with a signpost, and he asks you for a few dollars to take you in to see the Rafflesia. Now, we've learned from our previous trips that uh, you send one person in to have a look at the Rafflesia. Because what they do is even if the flower's on its way out, they'll still take your money and then you get in there and you find you're looking at a bunch of sludge as, it's, as the flower decays. So um, if you go there, send one person in, see if it's worth going in, then to send the rest of the group in. Okay, what do we find in uh, pouring? These things are a terrestrial orchid, uh, Acanthophipium, another genus which I'd never heard of. And... Uh, Flower which doesn't open very well and doesn't much, but again, very intriguing. Uh, Dendrobium diamondowi, looks like that. So many of these are desirable, which you just can't get. And I have no idea why these orchids have 
evolved this way. This is Dimorphocus rosei. You can see these got a raceme coming down here. They've got yellow flowers at the top and these white flowers at the bottom on the flat, same flower spike. Now they're the two flowers. It's yellow on the top one and the white one at the bottom spotted. They both have male and female parts, but the flowers are totally different. So if anyone can come up with a plausible explanation what evolutionary benefit this has, well, I'm delighted to hear it because nobody knows. But um, spectacular to grow. Not easy to photograph as the flowers hang down, but um, worth the effort. Uh, another trichoglottis. Um, and this area is, um, this genus is much in need of an overhaul because they're so difficult to identify these flowers. And, uh, and as you can see, it's got these little hairs on the on the labellum. Uh, Stick orcus, collected, named after, um, which is des described by Peter O'Byrne and um, Linus Gokasing. Linus is a wonderful um, local. He uh, works for Kapandi Orchid Garden and he goes out, he has permits to go out to the right to the where the logging is being done and uh, collecting all the orchids which have been fallen out of the log trees and he's uh, a wonderful source of new uh, species. Uh, for Australians, um, a visit to the Kundasang War Memorial is a must on our trips to Borneo. Um, this is the Kundasang, uh, the Kinabalu War Memorial at Kundasang. And uh, this is um, a memorial which was actually built by a friend of mine from school, Ross Bastian, uh, who's made a, uh, made it a lifelong mission to go to every Australian war grave or war cemetery and put up a plaque and um, he's paid for all this out of his own money and uh, everywhere every Australian cemetery around the world has one of these plaques uh, commemorating what happened here. Now if you, for those who don't know this, the story about the, um, the Sundakan death march, um, this was um, during the Second World War there were two, about 2,000 British and Australian prisoners of war in a place called Sundakan which is over, on the, over here on the island of Borneo onto the which to the east, and as the war was going badly for the Japanese, they decided to take them all out of that area and march them across to uh, Sundakan. Uh, to, and uh, on this death march, the, the two thousand of the two thousand six Australians escaped, and they're the only ones that survived. So six out of two thousand survived this death march, and uh, this is the memorial that they've got and it just uh, for Australians it's a quite a, a, a sobering place to go. Um, and I see, they see things like this E Frost, H Frost, these were two brothers so both of them from Victoria uh, died uh, in, within uh, about three weeks of each other. One died on the uh, in August and the other died in July. So about four weeks apart. They... Anyway, we'll move on to more interesting things. Appendicular torta, uh, a lovely flower, another appendicular. And this one here, Nabaloa augustifolia. Now I'm delighted to say that this is actually in bloom in my orchid collection at the moment. And uh, the flowers are very small, only probably about half a centimetre in size, but um, just a delightful little orchid, which once I saw this, I was determined to get one for my collection. So, and another Stichorchus. Chuwoei, and this is named after Geoffrey Wood, uh, who wrote the book on the dendrochylums of uh, Borneo and the uh, orchids of Borneo. So JJ Wood. And that's the flower. Uh, forget that. So this is the hotel we stay at at Mount Kinabalu. And you can see the mountain dominating in the background. Um, one of those rare photos, rare times that you actually see the summit of the mountain. Um, this hotel is actually a Russian owned hotel. So I don't know how they're getting on at the moment with what's happening in uh, uh, 
over there in the, in Europe, but uh, I suspect this hotel is now uh, probably been confiscated. So now, when we first started going to this area, these uh, conifers were around about this high. Uh, so I gathered by the next time I get there, this mountain view will probably be gone. Those conifers will have uh, grown too tall for it. Uh, another a very different sort of orchid, Mycoranthes. I've ne never seen these in cultivation, but uh, that gives you some idea of the flowers. And uh, sometimes you get lucky when you're doing your photography. And I just as I was about to photograph this, this bee arrived, and you can see uh, definitely a, a pollinator going straight into the flower. And uh, it's interesting. You've I've seen lots. I won't say lots. I've, I've been fortunate to photograph several plants with a bee, with a pollinator is visiting them and uh, picking up pollen. But I've yet to ever see a, a pollinator delivering pollen to an orchid. It happens very very rarely. There's a wonderful story of um, Charles Darwin, who lived in Kent. He was very wealthy. He was a member of the uh, Wedgwood family. And, he, and during springtime in his garden uh, over in Kent, he'd uh, sit there with his cup of tea, watch, looking at the orchids in his garden, trying to see what pollinated them. And he sat there for 20 years and never once saw an orchid pollinated. Now, that's called dedication to, to natural history. So that shows you how rare it is for a pollinator to be actually spotted. Uh, another bulb of film, probably pollinated by ants, was covered in ants. And one of my favourite orchids on Mount Kinabalu is this fire trailed subtrilobus. It's a massive, massive plant. This flower spike stands probably about four or five, maybe five, six feet tall. And that's the flower on it. Most people have probably never seen this one. Getting close to the end of our trip now. So uh, I didn't go climbing Mount Kinabalu on that trip. We just dropped, visited the uh, the gardens at the base, which again is something you must do if you ever go to Borneo. Go and visit the mountain garden. Wonderful orchid collection. Anyway, ended up in uh, Kota Kinabalu. That was our hotel there. This one cost a little bit more. It's probably about $80 a night. And... Uh, and we met up with Tony Lamb, which is this guy here. He's the expat who I've been talking about. And he took us to his yachting club uh, to have a drink. And when we got there, we've met up with this guy here. He was our guide on our previous trip. He and his brother just happened to be there and just shows you what a small world it is. You know, all the people in Borneo and where we were to meet up with. And here he is in the jungle with us. And uh, that was our previous trip. So uh, I'm going to quick, tree, quickly finish up with Mount Pune. Um How are we going time-wise? I've got my watch with me. Uh, seven o'clock. Okay. Okay. Gunung Mulu National Park is a World Heritage Area. It's um, you can see here. Uh, Long Pasia is. Um, round about this area here and uh, yep so Mount Muru is here Long Pasia is here and over the other side of the mountain is Mulu and uh, so flew down to there and this is the entrance to Mulu National Park this is your accommodation and some of the orchids there now Mulu is famous for its uh, limestone caves one of the caves there has been uh, explored is over 100 miles long and a lot of people go there for the caving and also for the trekking of the, up Mount Mulu. Um, but uh, this is one of the local orchids there. Uh, the only reason we went there is that uh, Andrew, uh, my colleague, had never been to Mulu, so we decided we'd fly there by, on our way to Kuching. And uh, this was described by Paul Omerod, who's an Australian guy who lives up in Queensland. Um, he's written a number of articles and describing different orchids, but he's one of those crazy guys who is an in, incommunicado. He refuses to talk to anybody. I've invited him to come give talks at our orchid meetings. I've offered to fly him down, but he's not interested in doing any of that sort of stuff. So anyway, that's his nature. Uh, so this is um, Plopoglottis. These white spots are a dead giveaway as to what species it is. There's nothing wrong with the leaf. That's just how it is. 
and that's the flower on it. Another trichoglottis scaphidra. And the reason we went to go there is not because of the orchids. We weren't, were only there for half a day. So we wanted to go down to Deer Cave and see uh, this, this wonderful site. Now, this is a photo I have for people who know a little bit about history. If you look at the silhouette here, it's a, it's a classic Abraham Lincoln. But um, this is Mulu National the Deer Cave. And this is not my video, but this is what we went to see. This is the bats coming out at night out of Deer Cave. And you can see this it's not smoke coming out the top. It's actually millions and millions of bats. Now, Again, the noise you hear in the background is the cicadas. Uh, what you don't see in video, in presentations like this, is the actual noise and smells of the jungle. But um, if you're lucky enough and you're there, you occasionally see a, a hawk or an eagle come flying out and catching one of these uh, bats in mid-flight. Now, now this next slide is deliberately black was the one and only time I've been in the jungle where I forgot to take a poncho with me. And in our hurry to get to the deer park, the deer cave before sunset, uh, I forgot. And as we were about halfway there, which was about a five kilometer walk, I, the heavens opened. It was this massive roar and I thought it was like a locomotive coming through the jungle. And the heavens opened. I had nowhere to protect my camera. And by the time we got back to the, our hut, my camera was absolutely saturated and, uh, and non-functioning. So we had a very, very cold night because I stripped the camera down, set everything up in front of the air conditioning unit and just left the air conditioning on all night and slowly watched all of my camera's functions slowly come back. And uh, so, so unfortunately we didn't get to see the bats at the cave. It was, um, I'll have to go back another time. So anyway, from here we flew down to Kuching, which is the capital of um, Sarawak. And you'll see up in, the, uh, I don't know if it's on this mountain here, no. And uh, there's a place up, way up here on North Kalimantan. Uh, there's a place called Barrio, which is, I can't actually see it on this map, but um, it was one of the other places we went and very well, well worth taking a flight from uh, Miri up to Barrio, which is around this area here. This is another mountain up there called Mount Trusmadi, uh, not Mount, uh, Mount Murud, which is the third highest mountain in, uh, in, in uh, Borneo. And that's one of my next trips, looking at things doing that mountain. Anyway, um, flew into Kuching for the Asian Pacific Orbit Conference. I was giving a talk at this conference, and um, these are just some snaps of the displays they put on. Um, it's pretty spectacular. And these are some of the orchids that were there, uh, which I'd never seen before. Uh, new species from Palawan, uh, Vandopsis, Dendrobium, Cymbidium. And these were in a collection by a, a guy who was being interviewed on uh, Sarawak TV, um, talking about the orchid show. And when he finished, I started chatting to him and uh, he mentioned that he was from Barrio. And... Um, He's, and I said, yeah, I've been to Barrio. And he said, no, no, nobody's ever been to Barrio. Nobody goes to Barrio. I said, no, no, I've been to Barrio. And I showed him this photo of this lady. And you can see they have this, um, they put these weights on their ears and they extend the earlobe. And he took one look at this and he started laughing. And he said, she was a, she's a school friend of mine. We were at school together. He said, you have been to Barrio. And with that, he then invited me to come to Barrio again and uh, stay with him. And he's going to take me out to the rainforest. And, sh and the thing about Barrio is that it's about probably about 100 square kilometres of Karangas forest. So there's heaps and heaps to explore. So that's the trip that we did on last trip. Now, the next trip to Borneo is coming up. Um, I'm started planning it now. Uh, we're going to go to Mount Tambu Yukon, which is on the backside of Mount Kinabalu. This is Mount Kinabalu. Uh, this is Pouring Hot Springs where we're at, and it's a 40 minute drive to go to the backside of Mount Kinabalu, which has been very little explored for orchids. So I'm hoping that we'll find things, different things there. Now Mount Kinabalu has something like a thousand 
orchids which are on that mountain, on one mountain alone. You know, Australia has something like about 1,500 species of orchids, of which so it just gives you some idea of how orchid rich Mount Kinabalu is with a, a thousand species. That's just phenomenal. So that's the next trip. So um, anybody who's interested, feel free to contact me. Anyway, so that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much. That was amazing. Thank you so much, John. Um, I'm not sure I'm really keen on doing that much in the jungle. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> I really appreciate people who are. <laughs> Look, it's a wonderful experience. It's not as difficult as it looks. Uh, it's, yes, it's strenuous in certain places, but um, the, what you see and what you uh, and photograph is well worth it. And, uh, I just don't like can, bugs. Uh, <laughs> it goes with the territory. You can't get away from it. But um, it, it, it's, a, it's a wonderful when you come back and you think you've actually done it. It's just uh, amazing. Uh, can I ask a question, uh, John? Uh, yes, John. How much um, orchid um, culture is actually done outside of the rainforest? Are there a lot of people in Borneo growing orchids? Are these being propagated so that some of these may eventually become available to the greater orchid population? Um, that's probably one of my um, one of the saddest parts about going to these places is seeing how little people know about their own country. Um, you you travel through this, you know, you climb up Mount Kinabalu, for instance, and uh, you know, it's a well-worn tourist track. And what really disappoints you is a number of empty plastic bottles just thrown down. And uh, and most of the people who are trekking these are the local Malays. And, uh, you know, the, you know, certainly you get a lot of tourists, but most of the tourists are there are local Malays from mainland Malaysia, you know, Peninsular Malaysia, who have gone across to Borneo to, for a holiday. And the lack of respect for the... You know, for the jungle is quite amazing. Uh, you know, in Australia, we, we were probably like that about 40, 50 years ago, and we had a big program, Clean Up Australia, and get rid of all the, you know, the cans down the highways and bottles and rubbish. But uh, Malaysia doesn't seem to have yet discovered that uh, they've got, they're sitting on something which everyone wants to go and, and visit. And, and but there, there are people who do grow orchids, and most, you know, most people in the forest will have orchids uh, growing in their houses. Uh, on their houses, but, um, but in the main cities, it's it's a, a lot of ignorance about what they've actually got in their backyard. Do you ever uh, collect seed for for propagation? Uh, when oh, you I would love to. I'd love to, but if I got caught with it going into Australia, I'd be in big trouble. <laughs> oh, oh <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, there was that problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's there. It's even worse than here. Our biosecurity is dynamite. <laughs> they, uh, they've just introduced regulations here that we can't send a seed out of Australia, let alone bring seed in. <laughs> so you can't send it out either? Yeah, that's, uh, that's all the, you can, but it's going to cost you. I think it's like $120 or $200 to get a permit or something. And uh, so I don't know how, how many people are going to actually, I, I, you know, I think it's a general blanket thing on seeds. and. Uh, but um, I, I can't see awkward people not doing it. You know, I can just chuck seed in an envelope and post it. And who's going to pick it up? But um, I don't want to go on the record saying I'm doing that. But uh... Okay, we didn't hear that. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, this is the problem now, isn't it? Because because of all the restrictions in, in um, transportation of, of plant material, that uh, we... There is no way to propagate these things and maybe uh, conserve them in in collections. Well, the only way is really is flasks, sending flasks around now. You know, the Australian government will accept sterile flasks, but they still you know inspect them diligently to see if there's any you know bugs growing in them. And uh, and depending on which quarantine centre you come through, whether you go through Melbourne, Brisbane, Sydney, you know, it depends who's on the, on that day. If they've got in no knowledge of flasks, then they may confiscate them without, you know, any without due cause, just because they're ignorant of their own regulations. You know, it's fraught with danger. And, uh, but but the, uh, the but the plants, in order to have the flasks, you need to grow the the seeds. So you know, exactly. you have the plants in in the jungle, they produce seed. Um, 
certainly this would could be a, a way of propagating them and preserving them, but it, it's made very difficult. Yes, there's, there's places like, uh, as I said, mentioned Kapandi Butterfly and Orchid Park, which is um, grown by a guy called Stephen, and he's got a many. He's got permits to go into the jungle, uh, government permits to go and collect the orchids from the logging areas. Now, he's obviously it's illegal to take stuff out of the forest, but people do obviously, and but he's got a, pro a proper permit, and he actually then tries to propagate them and uh, get them. Uh, and get the you know orchids distributed around the world for protection. You know, there's, uh, it's got to happen because the rainforest is just going. You know. I, I guess the encouraging thing for me was that the amount of destruction, of, the amount of logging, is far is decreased significantly over the last ten years. You know, the road to Mount to Long Pasio was you would have seen probably a dozen logging trucks every time we drove down it. This time, the last trip, we didn't see one logging truck. And all the logs, and I've got photos of, you know, of tracks or, along the side of the road. There would be kilometres and miles and miles of you know, logs just lying there, ready to be taken out. But this trip, none of the logs were there. They'd all, they'd all been cleared and there weren't any new ones. So it was very encouraging that something's happened in terms of the, you know, the stopping of the logging in certain areas. Uh, what month? Not sure yet what month my trip is. Um, it'll probably be about a two to three week trip. Uh, the best time to go to Borneo is just before or after the rainy season. The rainy season starts probably November, December and goes through to about February. And uh, if, there's lots of orchids in bloom at that time, but the roads are almost impassable. And climbing up the mountain in the wet is very difficult and, and, and fraught with uh, danger. If you, the last thing you want to do is slip and break a leg or something like that. So, so we tend to go before the rainy season starts or after the rainy season. Uh, Mid-year, which is what this trip was, July, there, wasn't, there weren't as many plants in bloom, we found, because it was obviously the, sort of the dry season. What a one! What wonderful trips! I envy you. But they're much harder than than the ones that most of the ones that I've been on. Well, oh, this one you. is harder. Did you say? <laughs> no, your your trips in Borneo are uh, seem to be a lot more rugged than uh, than ours in South America. Well, you've probably got more people going to South America, so that they're, <laughs> they're catering better for you. But um, but it, but it, but it's something to keep in mind. Hopefully, someday. Uh, before I die. Well, the, well, the, <laughs> the trips can be as hard. They can be hard as easy as you want to make them. You can, you know, go to the go to Mount Kinabalu and just wander around the orchid garden, you know, which is very easy. You can drive right up to the orchid garden, so you don't have to walk anywhere basically. So. Yeah. Well, that that's something to look forward to. Yeah. So, do we have any other questions? Everybody's mesmerized. I'll ask a question, well, please. This is. This, so this yeah. is Pat. I live uh, about an hour or a bit more away from where Terry Kennedy lives, also in in uh, Canada. Anyway, I heard your question of, or speculation about what might be the reason that the dimorph orchis has two different flower types, and it occurs to me that it, to wonder if it's perhaps because the, it has different kinds of um, some kind of fragrance or. Uh, wax or whatever, and therefore attracts two different kinds of pollinators. Possibly, I have never, never smelt the orchids. I can't remember smelling the flowers on that one to see whether they were different. Um, it's, it's your your guess is as good as mine. I, I can accept that a possibility. It's better Seems than some me, I've heard. Think, <laughs> thank, thank you. I, I've seen the flowers before, and and it seems to me that from your pictures as well that the the um, the texture on, so on them is somewhat different. That the yellow form is less waxy than than the um, the, the creamy speckled form. Mm -hmm. So that what what gave me the idea that it might be that. But anyway, interesting. That was a good question. Thank you very much for a super program. Thank you. Are we done, I think? I think uh, we're done. Now, uh, John, we are going to go into our 
in person show table. Yeah. And then after that's done, we're going to go into our virtual show table. You're most welcome to stick around and see what we grow in Canada. Um, it's a bit different than what you can grow. And you know, I'd, love to, I'd love to stick around because I'm just in awe of you guys actually growing walkers in Canada with all the snow that you get. You know, I have enough difficulty when it gets down to four and five degrees, let alone minus 40 degrees. <laughs> actually, it's 16 degrees here today. How much? 16. Yeah, that's all right. I presume yeah, that's... It, uh, we're that's having a really mild... This is a record, uh, record setting day. There's some sort of storm that's around blowing things around and blew in a whole bunch of warm wind. And all well, the snow's the, melting. Oh, cool. So I think the temperature here is about 16 at the moment, I think. Yep, it is 16 degrees here as well. So. Oh, there and we it go. Was <laughs> min it was minus 10 on Friday. Oh, well, no, no, but definitely not that. <laughs> it, it was minus 24 at our cottage last week. Oh, great. Give me, I, I'm, every time I visit Canada, the, worst, the coldest place in the world I've ever been was Calgary and uh, going to Lake Louise. And uh, I think it was about minus 40 or something. And uh, I, I, I just almost froze to death. So I just don't have the clothing for that sort of weather. Yeah. <laughs> but you do wake up. <laughs> you do. <Yeah. laughs> Before we do the show table, I, I'd like to thank John. That was incredible. Um, you know, you've got experience w w with these orchids, and it, it amazed me at the diversity and, and the number of plants that are still out there that, that even experts like you cannot yet identify. It just shows you what, what's, what's, you know, in the world and, and, and the amazing uh, diversity and, and Hopefully it won't be lost as you uh, posited in your you know, question about the move of the capital city. So um, I, thank I you for sharing that with us. Here. No, my, my yeah. pleasure. And I, and I think the tragedy is, is how much of the rainforest has been destroyed and we didn't even identify what was missed. We've got long gone now. Yeah, I, I, I must admit I empathized with you when I saw that trip down the, the logging road. Um, I, I, I went to Calgary, so my daughter lives there, last last year and, and I, I thought I'm going to try this route that I've never taken it's supposed to be shorter so Google Maps tells me so I'm heading up towards Sudbury and I have to turn left and I get to the turn I got oh my god I was not expecting 80 kilometers of dirt logging road but uh, I did it was amazing um, thankfully there was no one out there because um, I was probably going between 80 and 100 kilometers an hour on a, on a, on a bumpy uh, dirt road. So, uh, but I, I felt for you when I saw you going along those those dirt roads in uh, in, in uh, Malaysia. Yeah, it's fun. <laughs> it's, it's, it's interesting, especially when the potholes are about two meters deep. 